hearing, and uh, we're going to take uh, uh, Assemblywoman Melissa Melendez uh, out of order at this time. Uh, she has a, a flight she's catching today, and uh, welcome, uh, AB 1869. Thank you, Senator Stone, and there are no other members of the committee. So thank you, Senator Stone and staff. Um, prior to the passage of Prop 47, the theft of any firearm was considered a felony. Prop 47 amended this statute to where the firearm of a theft, as long as it does not exceed value of $950, would be considered a misdemeanor punishable by the issuance of a simple ticket or a fine. Simply put, AB 1869 would restore the penalties for gun trafficking and theft of a firearm to what they were prior to the passage of Prop 47. It is joint authored by Assemblyman Adam Gray and is sponsored by the California State Sheriff's Association, the California Peace Officer Association, and the California District Attorneys Association. And it also has received bipartisan, or excuse me, support from numerous law enforcement agencies, gun rights activists, crime victims associations, and local governments. Here to speak in support of the bill today is Sean Hoffman from the California District Attorneys Association and Corey Salzillo with the California State Sheriff's Association. I ask for your I vote. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Assemblywoman. Witnesses in support. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sean Hoffman with the California District Attorneys Association. Um, not to belabor the point made by the author, but um, I know last year there was some question as to whether Prop 47 had changed the penalty for this. We've since seen in subsequent appellate court opinions that uh, Prop 47 did in fact convert receipt of stolen property and grand theft of a firearm into misdemeanors where the value was less than $950, which leaves us in a position where uh, the penalty for stealing a firearm under current law is based solely on the value of the gun as if a $300 firearm is somehow you know, less dangerous than a $951 firearm. We don't think that makes much sense and appreciate this uh, common sense effort to close the loophole. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Chairman, members, Corey Salzillo on behalf of the California State Sheriff's Association, pleased to co-sponsor this bill again, uh, work with the author and uh, uh, Mr. Gray on this very important public safety measure. Uh, we're pleased to support it in the interest of time. We just ask for your vote. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, those in support? Uh, John Lovell, Association for Los Angeles Deputy Sheriffs, California Association of Code Enforcement Officers, Association of Deputy District Attorneys, uh, California College and University Police Chiefs, California Narcotic Officers, LA County Professional Peace Officers, LA Police Protective League, and the Riverside Sheriff's Association, all in support. Thank you. Jonathan Feldman, California Police Chiefs Association, in support. Thank you. Sergeant Shalisa Williams, San Bernardino Sheriff's, in support. Thank you. Good afternoon, Kira Ross, on behalf of the cities of Murrieta and Burbank, in support. Thank you for coming. Amanda Wilcox on behalf of the California chapters of the Brady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence in support. Thank you. Any others in support of AB 1869? If not, uh, I'll call the opponents to AB 1869, please. Good afternoon, Micah Doctoroff. On behalf of the ACLU of California, we are here in respectful opposition to the Assemblywoman's Bill. On November 4th, 2014, in our statewide general election, California voters overwhelmingly approved Prop 47, which, among other things, reduced the classifications of certain nonviolent felonies and wobblers to misdemeanors. The voters made their decision after being fully apprised of the arguments now being raised in support of AB 1869. Specifically, they were told in the vo official voter information guide published by the California Secretary of State and mailed to every California voter that stealing a handgun valued at less than $950 would no longer be a felony. They were also told that the proposition would maintain penalties for many gun crimes. These penalties were in place before Prop 47 and they remain in place today. And despite all of these arguments, voters still overwhelmingly passed Prop 47. Given the breadth of existing statutes punishing gun crimes, we do not think it necessary to un undo the informed choice of California voters. And for this reason, we respectfully oppose. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any others in opposition? Please come forward. Mr. Chair, Ignacio Hernandez on behalf of the California Attorneys for Criminal Justice in opposition. Thank you. Last call. Any other opponents? AB 1869. Uh, if not, uh, Assemblywoman, uh, thank you very much for bringing this forward to uh, uh, talk about a wobbler. I think uh, 
the citizens that voted for Prop 47 never intended to have, I don't believe, from my view, uh, firearms be a, a misdemeanor uh, after being stolen. So I applaud you uh, for your efforts uh, to bring this forward. If you'd like to be a closing statement. Um, thank you, Senator Stone. I, I'll keep it brief. I mean, we've had this discussion before. I yeah. just ask for the I vote of the committee. Thank you. Uh, with all of our uh, exhaustive uh, <laughs> members here, I, I will make the motion and we'll leave the roll open uh, so other members uh, will you. be able to vote and safe travels. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Okay. Okay, so will, uh, will you please uh, we'll call the roll? <laughs> Hancock, Anderson, Glazer, Leno, Lou, Monning, Stone. Aye. Stone, aye. Up. Okay, so we're going to go in the order of uh, Assemblywoman Egvin, uh, AB 2147, followed by uh, Assemblywoman Rodriguez, followed by Assemblywoman Calderon, followed by Assemblywoman Chang. Okay? If they're, yeah, if they're here. AB 2147, Assemblywoman, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, we'll take a lot of your time. There's a simple little bill that we think is adds one extra deterrent against uh, human trafficking. Um, this AB 2147 simply allows cities and counties uh, to be able to impound a, somebody's vehicle who is in the act of buying sexual favors. Um, it, so previously you'd had to go before your, to your county, get a special ordinance. This just says that you are allowed under the law for one more deterrent against hopefully to people to be able to purchase sex for sale. It, it already applies to, to people who are selling sex. We think it should apply for those who are purchasing it as well. And I respectfully ask for your I vote. And we do have people here in support. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have witnesses in support of uh, AB 2147. Please come forward. Good morning, Tori Verber Salas, our District Attorney of San Joaquin County. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and speak on behalf of this bill. This bill would allow us uniform seizure and equality throughout the state as to impede purchasers' mobility to commit these crimes of purchasing of human beings. It will also allow us the ability to address the underlying offense without increased incarceration or enhancements attaching. The seizure of the vehicle is the key tool and instrument to law enforcement in preventing the purchaser's ability to commit these crimes. As a 30-year member of the officer, office and a former homicide prosecutor, I often interviewed, worked, and helped in the assistance of rehabilitation of these women and, and men. And in all of them, they describe the same thing. The vehicle is often, most often where the crime occurs. I recently spoke with a woman that I had assisted over the years who had spent 12 years in and out of the life on the streets. 10 out of 12 tricks a day she served were done in a mobile vehicle, were done in the vehicle. The vehicle allows them the tool to either drive to the location agreed upon or drive to the area where these crimes occur and solicit the individuals. It is also the last clue that we'll ever have in these cases, such as the one that I assisted in the prosecution of, of a serial killer of women and men who work on the street. Because they always remember the vehicle. To them, it is the gun in many senses of the word, because it's the last clue that we have before something terrible occurs. We're not seeking additional time or incarceration or mm -hmm. any of those types of things. We're looking at this crime and we approached it in a manner where we could strategically address the criminal behavior, deter the conduct without incarceration, but still impose liability as we all are culpable for the crimes that we commit. And that is, the, and that is through the seizure of this vehicle. The goal is to imp impose the economical and then to connect these offenders to rehabilitative programs as they travel this journey. But we must do this because this key, key is key to our, our ability to address this crime. And it is a key to cutting off the instrumentality of the crime. And with this, we believe there's sufficient due process in the, in the bill to ensure integrity and protection of the rights of each of the individuals involved. For that, I thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Christine Reed, Chief Deputy, District Attorney, San Joaquin County DA's office, and just urge your I vote on this, on this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lou. Others in uh, support, please come forward. Uh, Jonathan Feldman, California Police Chiefs Association, in support. Thank you. 
Mr. Chair, Corey Salzillo on behalf of the California State Sheriff's Association in support. Thank you. Any others in support at this time? If not, anyone in opposition to 2147, please come forward. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Ignacio Hernandez on behalf of the California Attorneys for Criminal Justice, Statewide Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys. We are opposed to the bill. A um, couple of things. I think it goes without saying that the, both we have the utmost respect for the author and I think also for the objective of the bill uh, to reduce uh, sex trafficking and, and sex crimes is certainly a laudable goal. The problem is that this bill, we believe, is squarely without question um, unconstitutional. And so that's where we have some problems. In fact, current law, the way it's drafted and, and giving some authority to, look to uh, local government to adopt an ordinance was really an approach to try to avoid constitutional violations and I'll explain that in just a second. The Ninth Circuit in City of Cornelius versus Miranda or Miranda versus City of Cornelius uh, a few years ago said very clearly and explicitly that any vehicle seizure pre-conviction at time of arrest is per se unconstitutional. Very clear. In fact, almost the exact words from the decision. So this would essentially allow for unconstitutional seizures of vehicles. The Ninth Circuit went on to say that there can be exceptions. And the most uh, relevant exception is if leaving the vehicle there or choosing not to impound the vehicle it results in some sort of th uh, threat to public safety. And in particular, the Ninth Circuit articulated leaving a vehicle there blocks an intersection. It's in a red zone. Uh, or perhaps the individual is unlicensed to drive and so then he or she would, would then have to drive the vehicle and, and is not authorized to do so. Those are the types of exceptions. Other than that, it is a clear violation of the Constitution. Uh, and then unfortunately, the way this bill is drafted, it does not articulate or recognize or embrace any of the exceptions. So it would be, I believe, per se violation to uh, impound based upon this statute. Now, a little bit of background. Current law has the trigger that a local ordinance must be adopted in order for these impoundments to take place. That was something that was negotiated. I was actually involved in that bill, uh, I want to say in 2009, Assembly Member Fuentes bill. And while we still think there, it's constitutionally infirm, it's not as black and white unconstitutional as this bill. Uh, the idea there was that the local government would, have, would be in a position to identify the neighborhoods or the streets that are riddled with crime such that anyone involved in this type of activity or allegedly involved in this type of activity is contributing to a nuisance. And it is the local government that is in that position to determine where those, that nuisance may exist or not exist and therefore if someone is arrested for those crimes in those identified neighborhoods, they then, uh, the argument would be that the, the impoundment is pursuant to the, uh, to, to the abatement of a nuisance as opposed to a uh, penalty or a punishment upon the, the driver. Uh, we still think there's some constitutional issues with that, but it's more of a gray area than the way it is now. I actually was involved in negotiations on that. Removing the trigger for, of a local ordinance now puts the state legislature in the position to say, no matter where it occurs, whether it's on a street where it's riddled with crime or whether it's on a street that hasn't had an arrest in 20 years, it is considered a nuisance or it is also constitutional. It simply just doesn't fly. The Ninth Circuit was very clear. Um, I've actually used the Ninth Circuit uh, decision while I was in court uh, when I used to represent folks a few years back and I've had searches thrown out specifically for that reason. So I understand the intent. I think there's just no way to get over the constitutional infirmity and I think existing law at least puts it in a gray area. Uh, and for those reasons we're opposed and definitely want to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. Is there any others uh, opposed to AB 2147? Uh, seeing none, uh, Assembly Woman, maybe you want to respond to some of the uh, concerns. Uh, I will, and I'll, then I'll let an uh, attorney speak to an attorney. Thank you. Uh, but I will, do, I will say that we, that we believe, because there is, we, you, you cannot invoke this unless someone has been convicted in the last three years. So this is somebody who is a hab habitual purchaser of sex on the streets. 
Um, and we also believe that there, we have put in due process into the bill because if it is the only car or, or it's the only family member who needs that car, they can go and say it's a, a hardship for us not to have the car and be able to receive it back. More than that, I'll let our DA talk about it. Thank you. I think there's been kind of an interchange into the words of seizure and impoundment and the whole idea of this very purpose of the person driving the car into the neighborhood, utilizing the car to circle the neighborhood, looking for individuals who uh, they can solicit for prostitution, that type of thing. That is, in effect, a nuisance and does go into the very reasoning for taking of that vehicle. Because to leave that in the vehicle, it certainly, or leave the vehicle in those neighborhoods when the only reason why that neighborhood was driven into, or that car was driven into the neighborhood does create the nuisance and is, is part of the whole problem and the issue. And it is an impoundment and the, the process to get the vehicle back. I, I think in the letter of opposition it indicated the person would need the vehicle to utilize the vehicle to go to work, to take their kids to school, to go to places of worship, things of that nature, uh, which certainly is contrary to the whole fact that they're there in the first place. And they utilize the vehicle to commit the act. Uh, the acts are oftentimes committed inside the vehicle. It is a uh, mechanism for uh, the act of prostitution to take place and for them to flee the neighborhood. So to take that away as part of this, it's not seizing the vehicle for purposes of searching the vehicle for other purposes without probable cause, mm -hmm. something of that nature to lead to other things to get inside the vehicle because the vehicle is simply impounded and temporarily taken away from the person right. that's utilized it to commit a criminal act and used it. It's, you think of it as someone who takes a gun to shoot someone. They, the only thing they have is to take a vehicle. If they walk there, if they ride a bike, they're utilizing some other mechanism to get there. But the, the fact of the vehicle does allow them to commit these acts and to um, take the person in the vehicle and take them to some place where they can have these acts, uh, you know, you know, these acts are committed in the vehicles in a different locations. So it is a mechanism for these acts to be, um, you know, take place in the first place. And as we heard earlier this morning, certainly the act of prostitution is certainly treated very minimally in terms of a sentence in this state. Uh, six months, uh, now we want to make it a year, uh, but, you know, it's, it's not taken seriously. And to take away something that is very utilized by that person to commit the act is, is probably the only thing you're going to do outside of a very minimal jail sentence, minimal $200, $250 fine, and things of that nature. It doesn't have an impact. This is an attempt to do something that will have an impact on that individual. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, any comments of uh, Senator Amani? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So just some clarification um, from the author. You mentioned there had been some modifications or amendments. Uh, so this is if there's a prior conviction. There's a prior conviction within the last three years. And then you said there was some provision. There's also provision for due process if if it's a, the only car in the family or if the wife needs to use it to get to work, that they can go and say it's, it's in a hardship and then they'll be able to receive their car back out of impound through the judge. And who makes, the, the judge. judge makes the that judge. decision? Um, what if the, uh, the accused has multiple vehicles? They, they just impound the, the one vehicles. that was used in the commission right. of the crime. So one could suggest that a wealthy person with multiple cars, this would be less of a hardship than to somebody who owned one vehicle. Or would depend on the car. Yeah. Thank you. Um, did the opponent have any clarification on that? It's not up Go to ahead. me. Go ahead. Through the chair? Yes. Sure. Right. You did. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, just I, I think the I think it was referenced that the uh, the opposition letters referenced the due process proceedings. That is obviously post the seizure. Our position is that the seizure itself and seizure the legal term of the seizure does not exclude impoundment. It includes impoundment. So the seizure itself is what's unconstitutional on its face. It's a de facto violation, and so it's because it is pre-conviction that holding it for a day, two days, however long it is, even if there's a hearing later. The immediate, immediately it's a violation of the Constitution. So even if you allow it to be retrieved later on for whatever reason, uh, and in fact I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the, the Ninth Circuit case dealt with a temporary seizure and impoundment. So the Ninth Circuit has said you just cannot do it pre-conviction now. Somebody may have a prior, but, the, but my reading of this bill does not necessarily require that, the, that it's some sort of probation condition. Uh, of, the, of the prior offense. In fact, probation may have already been terminated. If probation wasn't terminated, then 
for that offense, they, that could be a probation condition. But if probation is then terminated, then there shouldn't be a reach beyond that original offense to then allow for law enforcement to seize the vehicle. It's inconvenient for law enforcement not to be able to do this. I get it. But there have been cases and cases, and there have been memos from law enforcement and DAs talking about, well, there are restrictions on what we can do. We simply cannot seize a vehicle because we don't like the offense that someone has been arrested for. It just, it is what it is. And again, current law is the only argument that potentially it's a nuisance. What you heard from the other witness, I think were good descriptions of certain specific facts that may justify a nuisance. But this bill does not narrow it to, to those facts where, oh, it's somebody was driving around the neighborhood and the only reason why they were there. What if it was in front of their house? What if it was, you know, they were in the neighborhood for some other reason? I mean, and that's the problem with this bill. It's not fact specific. And so because you cannot do that, then it is going to be unconstitutional because you cannot say that every arrest for this offense is always going to meet the criteria to justify to, for the definition of a nuisance. And that's the problem with trying to use nuisance. The local ordinance was the only way to try to get to nuisance because the local of government is going to know where those areas are that, that these activities occur frequently. And that was, that was the argument and why it was passed and why it was signed. Thank you. Thank you. It's, and I would say this is yes. not just an automatic impound <clears throat> anytime somebody drives through a neighborhood or parks in front of somebody's home. This is a person who has repeatedly offended, purchased young women for use in their cars yeah. in a, probably a neighborhood that they, uh, uh, they have been a nuisance in. That's what this bill does. Right. Is that what you'd like to close? Uh, I would respectfully ask for your I vote for one more tool in the toolbox to try to deter the rampant uh, human sexual trafficking that we have going on in this state. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you, Assemblywoman, I, and I agree with you. I think it's epidemic. Eighty percent of the, the vehicles are, uh, are used for the crime. Uh, I, I don't think I agree with uh, the attorney when we're talking about impounding versus seizure. This is a temporary seizure. Uh, it's in response to a crime that was committed. Correct. And so. Um, I, I applaud you bringing this forward. I'm happy to support it. Thank you. And so, as the only one here now, I'm, I'm going to make the. Oh, oh, there she is. Oh, glad you're back. Uh, I will make the motion to uh, to move this forward. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hancock. Aye. Hancock. Aye. Anderson. Glazer. Leno. Liu. Morning, Stone. Aye. Stone, aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Senator Rodriguez. Assembly member, go ahead and please uh, present AB 1680, item number six. Good Thank afternoon, you. Chair and members. The proliferation of drones or inexpensive, easy to fly, remotely piloted aircraft that can soar thousands of feet high in the air and come equipped with powerful video cameras is rapidly becoming a hazard to our first responders. Recently in California, a pilot flying a helicopter with seven firefighters on board who were battling a brace threatening nearby homes saw a four rotor drone only 10 feet from his windshield. This forced him to make a hard left to avoid collision above 500 feet above the ground. In another incident, the sighting of five drones in the area of a wildfire that closed Interstate 15 in Southern California and destroyed numerous vehicles caused air tanker crews to be grounded for 20 minutes as the flames spread. Existing law makes it a misdemeanor to interfere or impede police, firefighter, and EMS personnel at the scene of emergency. 
AB 1680 merely clarifies that an individual who is not at the scene of emergency can commit the crime remotely by using an unmanned aerial vehicle or drone that does interfere with emergency responders. AB 1680 does not create a new crime. It only clarifies an existing provision of the law. It has wide support from numerous law enforcement, fire, and emergency medical agencies. I respectfully ask for a vote. Are there speakers in support of the bill? Madam Chair and members, Corey Suzzillo on behalf of the California State Sheriff's Association in support of the bill given the proliferation of drones and unmanned aerial vehicles, <clears throat> especially that have, we've seen being operated around emergency scenes, particularly wildfires last year uh, that in fact did ground uh, firefighting equipment, particularly airplanes. Uh, we think this is an appropriate clarification to uh, just make it super clear that uh, the that operating a drone in this manner is covered uh, by the statute, and we'd uh, respectfully ask for your eye vote. Okay, thank you. Others in support? Thank you. Lauren Michaels on behalf of the California Police Chiefs Association in support. Thank you, Madam Chair. Russell Nowak on behalf of the California Fire Chiefs Association and the Fire District Association of California in support of the bill. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Others in support? Speakers in opposition? Seeing and hearing none, um, is there a motion to so, do pass to appropriations? So Good. Um, would you like to close? Something? I respect the last year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please read the roll. Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Anderson? Aye. Anderson, aye. Glazer? Leno? Lou? Monning? Okay. Stone? Stone, does, aye. It does go to appropriations, so there's always that opportunity. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. We have two bills from Assemblymember Calderon, 2 and 22. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Thank you so much. I will be presenting first AB 1241. Uh, AB 1241 continues the practice of fine-tuning state laws to address the economic impact of piracy upon very important industries in California. Piracy is a devastating economic crime that deprives artists, record labels, film, and television studios of hard-earned profits, resulting in losses of jobs in California where much of this content is created. The sale of fraudulent music, movie, and television products throughout the state forces legitimate retailers to compete with pirates that undercut their business, businesses by failing to pay for the original product and failing to pay local, state, and federal taxes. Crimes related to piracy are often viewed as victimless and, as such, are often treated lightly by the courts. While there are opportunities for the courts to levy fines, there is no mandatory fine in case involving uh, in cases involving piracy of copyrighted intellectual property. AB 1241 would create a minimum fine of $1,000 in second offense cases, providing a more effective deterrence against those with a demonstrated disregard for the state's laws against piracy. I respectfully urge uh, and I vote on this measure and, and with me to testify in support is Carl London from the Recording Industry Association of America. Madam, Madam Chair and members, uh, Carl London here on behalf of the Recording Industry Association of America. Uh, we want to thank Mr. Calderon for pushing this measure forward. As he mentioned, this still is a devastating pro uh, crime for our industry. Uh, people are surprised to learn that only in the last year and a half have digital sales eclipsed hard sales, which means hard sales are still a fundamental source of revenue for this uh, business uh, venture of making music. And this kind of bill is necessary because it helps at least in the case of a second offense. We're not even talking about the first offense, but in the case of a second offense, have there be some kind of penalty. We run into that all the time. This industry has been notorious for doing its own self-help. We go out and investigate the cases. We bring them to law enforcement. We sit second chair in the courtroom with prosecutors. And again and again, we find that there are occasions where treated very lightly where a person may get uh, jail time served and that's the end of the sentence. That absolutely uh, undermines the um, importance of this uh, industry to 
uh, particularly this state's economy, and in this case, this bill will at least say that in every case in a second offense, we'll at least get some kind of minimal fine. It barely takes away any discretion from the courts. They still reserve the right to impose fines, jail time, anything else they want to do, and we'd urge your support on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I respectfully ask for an I vote. Hancock. Hancock, I. Anderson. Aye. Anderson, I. Glazer. Leno. Lou. Monning. Monning, I. Stone. Aye. Stone, I. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. AB 2320 offers a common sense approach to our state's unmanned aircraft regulations, commonly referred to as UAS or drones, by clarifying that it is unlawful to operate a drone in the conduct of certain activities already unlawful in California. Some examples of such activities include prohibiting a drone from distributing, uh, excuse me, disrupting in emergency response activities or delivering contraband to a prison or jail. The new FAA regulations that went public earlier today still contain loopholes that AB 2320 addresses. California has a responsibility to ensure the safety of our citizens and at the same time help foster an industry that can provide a wide range of useful applications. The joint author of AB 2320 with myself is Assemblymember Lowe, who would like to speak on behalf of the bill as well. I thank you and I respectfully ask for an I vote. <coughs> has support on both sides, so please be brief. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and just want to e echo the comments of Senator Calderon in support of this. Uh, as was previously mentioned today, just this morning, uh, the FAA came out with additional uh, regulations, and so currently we know that this is a moving target, and we want to, with respect, try to come up with some reasonable guidelines around this approach. Respectfully ask for your eye vote. Okay, thank you. Uh, Steve Shea, representing DJI, in support. Others in support. There are speakers in opposition to the bill. Seeing and hearing none, are there questions or comments from committee members? Or the bill has been moved. Um, without any further ado, would you like to close? We respectfully ask for an I vote. Uh, Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Anderson? Aye. Anderson, aye. Glazer? Leno? Lou? Morning. Aye. Morning. Aye. Stone. Stone. Aye. Okay. That bill has enough votes to pass. We'll hold the roll open for the Thank absent you. members. Thank you, members. Okay. Um, next, uh, we have Assembly Member Chang, item number 30.